Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Meteor Burst. In this presentation, we'll discuss the fundamental principles of meteor burst communications at VHF frequencies. Meteor burst refers to a form of ionospheric propagation at VHF. Meteors leave highly ionized trails as they burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, with this increasing ionization typically lasting only a few seconds. Meteor heating begins at an altitude of about 120 kilometers, and most meteors are completely burned up before they reach an altitude of 80 kilometers. The resulting ionization trails are cylindrical, usually tens of kilometers long, but maybe only a few meters wide. These trails can be used to reflect VHF signals, bending them back towards Earth, and thus meteor bursts can enable long-distance skywave communications at lower VHF frequencies. Although not normally visible to human observers, many millions of meteors enter the Earth's atmosphere every day. Most of these meteors are very small, on the order of less than a millimeter to less than a centimeter in diameter. However, even small meteors are capable of creating ionization. The ionization created by a meteor is a function of both its velocity as well as its mass. Most meteors enter the atmosphere at very high speeds, typically tens of kilometers per second, and higher speed meteors create higher ionization. We'll come back to this again in a few minutes. Larger meteors burn for a longer period of time, and thus create more intense, longer duration ionization. Meteors can be grouped into two general categories. The first of these is sporadic meteors, and the second are meteors which occur as part of a so-called meteor shower. The way in which meteor trails are used for communications depends in part on which type of meteors created them. Let's start by looking at sporadic meteors. The vast majority of meteors are sporadic, which means there is no way to predict precisely when or where they appear, and they enter the atmosphere from random locations in the sky. The quantity of sporadic meteors does however vary in a somewhat predictable way during the course of a year. Generally, the greatest number of sporadic meteors enter during the months of June through August, and the least number enter the Earth's atmosphere during the months of February and March. Time of day, on the other hand, plays a very important role when it comes to sporadic meteors. As the Earth travels around the Sun, it also rotates on its axis. This rotational velocity is added to, or subtracted from, meteors that the Earth comes in contact with. In the morning, meteors hit the Earth head-on, and the Earth's rotational velocity is added to the meteor's velocity. In the evening, meteors are catching up from behind, and thus the Earth's rotational velocity is subtracted from the meteor's velocity. This added or subtracted velocity can be up to 30 km per second, which is quite substantial given that most meteors have velocities of tens of kilometers per second. As mentioned earlier, Higher speed means higher ionization, and peak meteor burst ionization therefore occurs in the morning, typically between 4 and 8 a.m. local time. The other type of meteors are those that are part of a meteor shower, which is created when the Earth moves through a field of debris. It's generally believed that these debris fields are material left behind by comets. These debris fields travel in known fixed orbits around the Sun, so the showers that they create occur periodically, that is, on predictable dates, during the year. One of the best known and largest meteor showers are the so-called Persids, which occur every year in August. Most meteor showers usually last for a day or so, and, during this time, the number of meteors entering the atmosphere increases by up to an order of magnitude. In fact, larger meteor showers often create large numbers of trails that are visible to the naked eye. An important difference between sporadic and shower meteors is that sporadic meteors appear to enter the sky from all directions. Shower meteors, on the other hand, appear to originate from a certain point or area in the sky. This point is referred to as the radiant. Meteor showers are often named after the star or a constellation closest to the radiant. For example, the Persid's meteor shower is named after the fact that the radiant is near the Perseus constellation. 
Now that we've covered the basics of Meteor Burst, let's discuss applications of Meteor Burst communications. The ionized trails left by meteors only last several seconds on average, and this means that messages conveyed using Meteor Burst must be short and or spread across multiple transmissions. For this reason, most Meteor Burst communication is used for non-real-time data collection, particularly in areas where cellular or other communications technologies may not be available. An example of this is the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Snow Telemetry or SNOTEL system, which has been in operation since the 1960s. SNOTEL collects snow and other weather-related data from remote locations across the western United States, and it transmits this data using Meteor Burst technology. Sites are typically battery and solar powered and often operate for a year or more without maintenance. The system-wide polling response rate in Snowtel is greater than 95%, meaning that Meteor Burst can provide reliable communications from locations where other technologies may be unavailable. There are three main considerations when it comes to using Meteor Burst for communications. These are the difference between so-called underdense and overdense trails, the maximum achievable distances and frequencies, and the types and orientations of antennas used for meteor burst communications. Meteor trails can be classified as overdense and underdense based on their levels of ionization. Underdense meteor trails are created by smaller meteors, usually those entering the atmosphere as sporadic meteors. The trails of these meteors have weaker ionization and reflection of VHF signals, but they're also more constant and predictable, and therefore most commercial and or government military applications, such as the Snowtel example we looked at earlier, rely on these underdense trails. Overdense trails are less common because they're created by less common larger meteors. Larger meteors produce trails with stronger ionization and signal reflections, which is always desirable. Unfortunately, larger meteors also appear at random, making them less suitable for systems that require reliability or consistency of operation. Therefore, overdense trails are primarily of interest in amateur radio communications. The achievable distances and usable frequencies are also important considerations for meteor burst communications. Since meteor burst is a form of ionospheric e-layer propagation, the achievable distances are largely a function of the height of the e-layer. Maximum distances for meteor bursts can be up to about 2,000 kilometers, but there's also a minimum distance of about 500 kilometers. This skip zone is similar to that seen in HF Skywave communications. With regards to frequencies, the ionization created by meteor trails is usable for longer periods of time at lower frequencies. The maximum practical frequency for meteor burst communications is about 150 megahertz, with a minimum of about 30 megahertz. It should also be noted that ionized meteor trails expand due to the rapid and extreme heating during burnup, and thus signals reflected from meteor trails may experience Doppler shift. The amount of shift is frequency dependent, but can be as high as 2 kilohertz at the higher end of the frequency range found in meteor burst communications. The orientation and direction of antennas can also be important for meteor burst communications, since this can have a significant impact on received signal levels. Recall that the ionized trails left by meteors are long but rather narrow. This means that the best results are obtained when signals are directed perpendicularly or broadside to the trails, as shown here, rather than at shallower angles. In the case of shower meteors, which appear to be entering from a given point or radiant in the sky, antennas would ideally be pointed at 90 degrees to the radiant. For sporadic meteors, on the other hand, a wider beam width antenna is more helpful. This is because, unlike shower meteors, sporadic meteors enter the atmosphere from all directions, and therefore there is no way to know or to predict the orientation of the trail. Let's end with a brief summary. Meteors leave highly ionized trails as they burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. These trails can be used to reflect VHF signals and enable skywave communications over longer distances. 
Meteors can be grouped into two general categories. Sporadic meteors enter the atmosphere constantly, but from essentially random directions. Meteor showers occur periodically throughout the year and lead to much larger numbers of meteors, with these shower meteors appearing from predictable locations or radiance in the sky. Meteor bursts is primarily used for transmitting non-real-time data, and most commercial or government-slash-military applications of meteor burst are based on sporadic meteors. Because meteor burst trails only last a very short period of time, communications must be short and or spread across multiple transmissions. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Meteor Burst. If you'd like to learn more about other propagation modes or about Rodian Short solutions for radio communications, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.